we're going to debunk some myths about influenza today and also talk about the interesting cycle of influenza, how it continues to go around and around each year and how the changes are made to the virus. But first, let's talk about how do you diagnose influenza? Well, there are the classical symptoms, which are fever, body aches, muscle aches, vomiting, diarrhea, usually in kids, sore throat, headache, fatigue, congestion, or runny nose, or both, chills, and a cough. So if people have those typical symptoms and they're feeling really lousy, oftentimes people then will um, get the kit, just like we used to have the COVID kits that we used all the time, where you swab up the nose, you put it, um, you mix it with something, like a pregnancy test, like a, it's an influenza test you can buy, or you can go into an urgent care clinic or another, your provider clinic and be tested. So there's rapid influenza test. My son is calling me, I will call him right back. Rapid strep test, rapid pregnancy test. Um, and again, it's a nasal swab. It's going to tell you then whether you are influenza positive or negative. And remember too, just like with COVID, you might check it one day and then wait another 24 hours or so and check again, because it might just be too early. Influenza has two types, influenza A and influenza B. Influenza A then continues on with some subtypes, but you feel really lousy with influenza no matter what. And I know that when I grew up, uh, my mom used to call everything the flu. She called vomiting the flu, diarrhea was the flu, a sore throat was the flu. And for sure, whether we had influenza or not, we'll never know because she didn't take us in to get checked. Could they check back then for A or B? I don't know, I'm gonna look that up and see. Let's talk about how long it's been around. It's been around for centuries. And that leads me to the first thing that I'm going to debunk in just a moment here that is a myth. Um, and again, like I always say in my videos, you can choose to believe it or not. It is a fact um, and I will just present the facts and we'll go from there. So influenza has been around for centuries. The earliest known influenza pandemic occurred in 1510. Historical evidence though suggests that it may have been around earlier say in ancient Greek and Roman texts have talked about it even further back than that documented pandemic of 1510. It's now February, so why does it peak in February? All right, let's talk about how this interesting cycle goes. Um, one reason is that it peaks in February because post-holiday exposure with family, friends, churches, etc. Cold, dry air because flu viruses thrive in colder, drier air, which helps them stay airborne longer and enter the respiratory system more easily. Weakened immune system, delayed vaccination protection, school and work spread, mutation and strain circulation. That's the biggest thing right there. So flu viruses mutate rapidly. And by February, the most dominant, hardiest strains, contagious strains, have taken hold, leading the surge in cases by February. So uh, it's like a race. The strongest ones survive, and by February, that's what we're left with. Incidents of influenza, and often the worst month, not only a lot, but sicker because of this hardy strain. Okay, so I wanna get this precisely right and explain it the best that I can, the way I understand it. Um, the genetic variations are occurring because of something called an antigenic drift. So I'll talk about that in just a moment again. But this is where the changes are occurring. The mutations in the virus genes create a new strain because these are the hardiest ones. These viruses have survived. The new strain is in effect now and in both influenza A and B. The strains that spread the fastest and infect the most people become dominant by mid-season, by February. I'm back. Okay, I had a, a big interruption and it, I need to finish this video and get it up, but my mom took a fall and we spent 10 hours in the ER yesterday and she's here with me. She's over there. Uh, so I want to come back and finish this up with you guys. Um, I'll start with myth number one, that the Spanish flu in 1918 
uh, did not come from vaccines because the flu vaccine didn't even uh, become a thing and be developed until the 1930s and 40s, that time frame. But remember, the Spanish flu was 1918. Okay, so that's myth number one. Now, back to the cycle. Let's talk about that a little bit. And I think I'll just, um, I'm not exactly sure where I left off. So I'm just going to say a couple of things real quick of where I think I left off at. For the regular flu season, the strongest surviving strains by February, that's why February we have so many cases and so many bad cases of influenza. It's a result of antigenic drift, not shift. That's a different thing. If an antigenic shift occurs, it can trigger a much more severe flu outbreak. So we're talking about antigenic drift. So by February, this virus now, this influenza virus has, is the strongest one that has survived. It has. So what happens for the rest of the cycle? By March and April, flu activity usually declines, and here's why. Herd immunity builds up. By late winter, a large portion of the population has already been exposed to the dominant flu strains or people have been vaccinated. Fewer susceptible hosts mean the virus has a harder time spreading. Number two reason is seasonal weather shifts. Warmer temperatures and higher humidity make it harder for the flu virus to survive in the air and on surfaces. We'll start spending more time outside, reducing close contact that fuels transmission. The flu mutations slow down. Since fewer people are getting infected, the virus has fewer opportunities to mutate and drift further. Other viruses tend to take over. So things like rhinovirus or enterovirus. Annual flu cycle. Spring and summer, flu declines and surveillance begins. The flu cases drop in March through May Scientists, physicians study which strains were dominant, those hardy ones, and they look for new mutations. They collect this data and they predict which strains might dominate next season. And that is where the flu vaccine development begins. The flu vaccine development is going on during the summer and then in the fall, the flu season starts and the vaccines roll out. By winter, the flu mutates and peaks in January and February. Antigenic drift causes small mutations, making certain that flu strains are more contagious and immune evasive. The strongest strains, again, as I've said, are the ones that outcompete the weaker ones and therefore peak in February. How does the flu vaccine fit into all this? It prepares the immune system. Myth number two is a big one. People think that when they get the flu vaccine, that means they're going to get the flu, and they swear that they've gotten the flu right after they have the vaccine, but that is impossible. So um, the response that people get from vaccines might be pretty severe, or it might be nothing at all. And each year that the flu vaccine changes, your response might feel different, but you're not actually getting a dose of the flu. That is a myth, and that's impossible. What you are probably feeling is a normal reaction, which is perhaps fever, body aches, uh, fatigue, headache. Those are normal reactions when we get vaccines that uh, they're doing their job in preparing our body. The worst vaccine for uh, feeling terrible for me personally was the shingles vaccine. Uh, I got that and within hours I was in bed with a fever. Uh, I had a reaction where I had this huge red hard knot on my arm, uh, body aches, headache. It was the worst feeling that I've had, but that doesn't mean that that shot gave me shingles. I've already had shingles. And when I had shingles here and it went into my eye and through my scalp, I had that years before I received the newer version of the vaccine. And I can tell you that in my particular case, the vaccine felt worse than having shingles. But that's just because I had that type of an immune response to it. That doesn't mean I got shingles. 
The vaccine decreases flu-related deaths and how, how sick a person might become. If they are vaccinated, it has been shown that they perhaps will have a better bit of protection. If so because these flu viruses are mutating constantly and we go through this cycle each year, that is again why the flu vaccine is changed each year. And each year that you might get it, again, you might feel different towards it. It might feel like nothing like it was for me this particular uh, fall. I think I got it in November and I got it with my mom and I, I felt great after. I felt absolutely nothing. But then I've also had the flu vaccine plenty of times where I feel really lousy. Another myth is that people just flat out don't believe that people can die from influenza, that that was something in the past. It continues to happen and, and the numbers are pretty big. I mean, anywhere between say 300,000 to over 600,000 flu related deaths still occur every single year. People die from influenza due to pneumonia, sepsis, organ failure, and yes, people who are at higher risk for having complications from the flu are usually advised to get the vaccine, but it depends on whatever the physician or caregiver suggests for that patient. Another myth is that people think that you can die more so from the flu vaccine than from influenza itself. And the research and the numbers throughout the years have shown that that is absolutely not true. And, you know, I used to give some of these facts and then just list all the details and go into the pathophysiology and all that's going on out there for the research that's available. I will still list a couple things down below. But um, I think, you know, in the future, I'll probably just say what the myth or fact is, and then you can check below if you want to hear more about it. The numbers on anaphylaxis is one to two people per million doses. So the last fact that I wanna say is that the flu, getting influenza is more dangerous and deadlier than getting the vaccine. And I'll list all of the information below so that you can look it up yourself. If you're interested in health topics, if you like to talk about myths and facts related to medicine, how about some medical mishaps and stories, please consider subscribing.